Welcome to a new episode of Technoculture. I'm your host, Federica Bressan, and today my guest is Richard Romaniello, a Grammy Award-winning audio engineer and producer with numerous nominations for engineering and producing audiobooks. Richard works at the Penguin Random House Audio in New York and has recorded the voices of hundreds of celebrities, including Glenn Close, Michael Douglas, Dolly Parton, Michael Moore, Carolyn Kennedy and John Fitzgerald Kennedy Jr. Richard has extensive experience in all phases of audio recording and production and with multiple genres, the spoken word, as well as music and theater. Welcome to Technoculture, Richard. Tell us about audiobooks and how you got involved in this business. Is that correct that you started by accident? Totally by accident. I, you know, I was working in 1985 in a little local studio in Rutherford, New Jersey, and um, I sent a resume to Bob Katz to assist him on location recording. And I never heard back from him. I sent him the resume in March of 85. I didn't hear anything. And then August of 85, I get a phone call from him saying, um, have you ever heard of Cadman Records? I said, no. He said, have you ever heard of Arabesque Records? I said, no. He said, well, I see that you went to the Institute of Audio Research. I went from September 1981, graduated in September 1982, and that you uh, worked with Malcolm Addy, who was the chief engineer at Abbey Road from 1958 to 1968. And I said, yes, I have. And he said, well, um, I'm going to call Malcolm, and if he gives you a good reference, I'll tell you who to call. So he calls Malcolm, and I, uh, I make the necessary phone calls to talk to the folks at Cadman Records. And um, next thing I know, uh, they hired me. So in, I started in September 9th, 1985, I thought I would do it for about six months because I was in the music recording business. And um, I was there for 24 years, five months and 10 days, or something like that, and was laid off during the economic downturn in 2009. And I kind of uh, freelanced for two and a half years. And then in September of 2011, I got hired by Penguin Books to be their in-house recording engineer for their brand new studio downtown in uh, Soho. And um, about five years ago or two years into my tenure at Penguin, we merged with Random House and became the largest commercial publisher on the planet. And we here at Penguin Random House, we produce about 1,200 audiobooks a year. And they average in length about 10 to 12 hours. Uh, some are much longer, and there are a lot that are much shorter, but the, it averages out to about 10 to 12 hours. And it takes us uh, three to four days in the studio to record it. It takes somebody about three or four days to edit it, and we turn this stuff around in unbelievable amount of time. It's, it's very short turnaround times uh, because we ride the coattails of the hardcover publishing and marketing. Although, here at, at Penguin Random House, we have our own marketing people, whereas most of the other publishing houses, um, what they do is the, the same people who do the marketing for their books also do their audiobook marketing. And they're really two very different markets. When I first started in 1985, I worked on about 30 new titles a year, and they were an hour to 90 minutes long. And we reissued 15 of the... Um, Cadman titles from the back catalog. And just to give you an idea, Cadman Records started in 1952, and their first recording was Dylan Thomas reading uh, Child's Christmas in Wales, which is probably one of the most famous spoken word recordings of all time. Uh, so many people know that. And when I went for my interview, when they showed me an LP, I recognized the label from when I was in high school English class when they played records of uh, Shakespeare plays, which Cadman had about 42 of them, recorded with British casts in the 1950s and 60s. So long story short, I completely got into the business by accident. Just amazing. But I became enamored with storytelling. And that's what an audiobook is. It's storytelling. It's the second oldest art form on the planet. And the first being uh, cave drawings. And then from cave drawings, came storytelling around the campfire. And it's just an incredibly intimate medium. 
uh, some of the stuff, you know, I had the luck to record, um, it was just, some of it was just so astounding, so wonderful. And, and uh, one of the most impressive recordings I ever worked on was uh, we did at Harper Audio, which was what Cadman was bought by Harper Collins. Um, we did a, the Dubliners series, um, and we had Irish actors reading each one of the stories, a different Irish actor reading. I recorded Kieran Hines reading uh, the story A Painful Case, which is a story about requited love, or unrequited love, I should say. And his performance was just so incredible and moving. It was just unbelievably beautiful. And when he was reading, he had his chin in his hand, and he was leaning up against the microphone, very close, speaking softly, but, you know, very, we had a really nice uh, Neumann TLM 170. And about 20 minutes in, I realized I could hear his wristwatch ticking. And it was a real watch with a, a movement. So it ticked about three or four times per second. And his performance was so incredible that we didn't want him to redo it. So I spent about two days editing the first 19 minutes of the recording, editing it down to a finished product, which was about 10 minutes. And I had to cut all the ticks out between the words or the, at least the phrases. And at the time, I, I'm trying to, we, we probably were using Sonic Solutions at the time, which had a, a, a de-clicking um, program in the no noise program. But I had to do each one individually. I couldn't do like a, a batch uh, processing. So it took me quite a while to do it. It was like editing analog almost. You know, I had to literally cut out or, or find every single click and, and get rid of it. And it paid off because it was just a wonderful sounding uh, recording and I didn't have to have them do it over again and not have that magic. And that's the thing about even in music studios, you know, they're always rolling tape because you never know when you're going to capture the magic. So that's certainly uh, something to uh, consider. Thank you for giving this overview of different aspects of what you do. I'm eager to ask you much more about your work because most audio engineers that I have met work with music, with rock bands or classical music, but it's quite rare to meet someone who specializes in the spoken word. And this audiobook is not even a niche anymore. It's actually a huge market. And it fascinates me because, like you said, it recuperates a tradition of circulating the spoken word like a podcast. So I am fascinated by right. the potential and the potential implications of what this means, of how the web and portable devices make it easier to circulate the spoken word, which mm. is storytelling. Even this podcast, in a way, it's storytelling. Today, it's your story. Speaking of storytelling, I want to tell the story of how we met because it's basically the reason why we're talking today. And that is... I was, and you were, at the Audio Engineering Society conference at the Library of Congress at the Packard Campus in Culpeper, Virginia, where, by the way, I also met, well, a number of incredible people, but another guest of this podcast, Richard Hess, episode number 10. So I met a lot of interesting people there, and browsing the lobby, I noticed this man with an Italian name on his tag, and I was so convinced you were Italian, so I just opened my arms and I called you Romaniello, and you responded with a big smile like we've always known each other, and you told me, of course, I am of Italian origins, but I don't speak Italian, I work with audiobooks, and this is how we started talking. Would you like to share what your memory of that moment is? Sure, I'd be happy to. You know, I kind of approached you uh, in the lobby and in my American Italian way. Um, first of all, I thought your talk at the conference was terrific. I thought you did a fabulous job, and and uh, uh, I was uh, captivated from the very beginning. I thought you were absolutely terrific, really. Thank you very much for the kind words. The fascination was indeed mutual. As soon as you said audiobooks, I knew I wanted to know more. You never think about it. Audiobooks are just there, but 
Who reads this thing? To read well is such an art. Is it the author who reads? Or is it trained people? Is it actors? Or is it actors that only do this? And I just wanted to know a lot more. To proceed in order. Let's go back to the origins. You said that you produced your first audiobooks in the 80s. Now, the world was a different place then. So how has the world of audiobooks evolved since then? Yes. Uh, well, you know, when I first started at Cadman in 1985, my finished product was an LP. I was uh, recording for LP release for long-playing records and, then, and also cassettes. We would put out um, a title uh, on, on both versions. And, and then uh, from there, you know, we'd move just to cassette only. And then once CD replication became cheap enough, we went to uh, all CDs, and now it's downloadable. We're almost at the point where we're going to stop putting out CDs, but libraries want physical copies, and some people just hold on to technologies that uh, even when they're dying, you know, and I have five reel-to-reels at home, so um, I know all about dying technology. When I first started, if we sold 750 pieces of something, that was considered the break-even point. Now, we don't even consider recording a title if we don't think we'll sell, say, 10,000 copies. And throughout the years, you have recorded hundreds of people, among which celebrities and politicians and actors. Mm -hmm. I dropped some names when I introduced you at the beginning of this episode. Can you drop some more? Well, yeah, I mean, I've worked with uh, famous politicians, famous, uh, you know, Academy Award-winning actors and actresses, or actors we'll use as a non-gender term. Um, so, let's see, I've worked with, uh, in terms of politics, I've worked with former Vice President of the United States, Dan Quayle. I worked with House Speaker Newt Gingrich and uh, the former governor of New Jersey, uh, two former governors of New Jersey, uh, Jim McGreevy and Christy Todd Whitman. Then in, in the field of... Um, JFK Jr. I, John F. Kennedy Jr. Yes, I did work with, and his sister, Caroline. I worked with John F. Kennedy Jr. It, it was 1988. Uh, I was still at Cadman Records. And um, he came in and he read his father's book, Profiles and Courage. And he was absolutely a wonderful person. He was, uh, there was no arrogance or attitude of, uh, you know, being an entitled person. He was just a regular guy. He, as a matter of fact, he showed up in a T-shirt and shorts and rode his bicycle. And he, he rode without a helmet. And I yelled at him. I said, you know, that's just crazy to ride without a helmet because I'm also, or I was, an avid cyclist. And um, I said, you got to be crazy to ride without a helmet. And actually, the next time he came, he wore a helmet. But um, <laughs> you told JFK Jr. to wear a helmet. I did. I told him to wear a helmet. Uh, <laughs> he was, I mean, he literally, he came from work. He, at the time, he was an assistant district attorney in New York. And uh, he came to my place of, uh, we were at 1995 Broadway at the time. And he came there literally on his, on his bike with no helmet, in T-shirt, and, and a pair of shorts. I mean, it was just... So unpretentious, and uh, and he was just he was so easy to work with, no attitude whatsoever. He was, uh, it, it was uh, stunning when I heard the news of him dying in the plane crash. And, and I have a friend who owns his own small plane, and I had flown out of the airport that um, John F. Kennedy Jr. Um, took his fateful flight from uh, on a number of occasions. So it's uh, every time I go there with my friend Charlie, you kind of reflect on that. Uh, it's kind of neat and tragic at the same time. But uh, yeah, he was, he was very cool. And his sister was uh, very gracious as well. What did she read? What we did is um, on the 10th anniversary of our recording of that, and now John was, uh, had died at, by that time, we re-released it. And we had Caroline do an introduction. So she came in and read for, I don't know, maybe a half hour or so and read an introduction. And that was incredible. So, you know, here it is. You know, I've kind of touched two Kennedys in person and were working on their father's book. So that was pretty amazing. That title was the first 
of my 13 Grammy nominations. I think it was nominated, I think it was 1990 when it was actually nominated um, for the Grammy, but uh, I had no idea there was even a spoken word category in the Grammys, but there is. I admit I learned about the existence of many of these awards preparing for this interview. So I see the list of your awards and nominations here. You've been nominated almost every year in the early 1990s and then in the early 2000s. During those years, you always kept recording music on the side, so not just spoken word. And you're a musician yourself. We're going to talk about that a bit later. We also have a small surprise for the listeners. What I want to ask is, you have experience both with music and the spoken word. And when someone says, I'm an audio engineer, that sounds like something very generic. So is the way you approach music any genre different than the way you approach the spoken word? And if so, how? What kind of skills are unique to this sector? Well, it's harder than I thought. My first day on the job at Cadman, the, the person who hired me, Ward Botsford, he was the executive producer at Cadman for about 20 years. And he was a very unusual character. But, you know, the first thing he said to me, he goes, this is not like recording Bob Springsteen. And he was being serious. He, he, he didn't know that it was Bruce Springsteen. But what he meant was, he goes, you, you have to capture everything from a whisper to a scream, and you can't ride the fader. You cannot pull the fader up and down to accommodate the reader. You've got to be able to set the microphone correctly and be able to capture a whisper or a scream without it being too noisy because we were still analog at the time, or breaking up, being too hot. And um, I thought, wow, it seems so easy. You know, you got one microphone and one mouth, you know, but it's harder than you think because there's nothing to mask any, you know, if, if you move, like, you know, you rub your arm or scratch your face or your leg, you hear that, and it takes you completely out of the storytelling mode especially when it's an audio-only presentation, because when we're, we see each other in person, the brain discriminates and we don't hear the swallows and the sniffles and the scratching and that sort of stuff. Our brain, because we're seeing the person as well, knows that those are unimportant things. But when we're only listening, those kinds of noises become distractions, mouth noises, uh, labanels, as they're, I think, technically called. Um, Though the, we don't hear those as much when we're looking at each other, but when it's audio only, those kinds of noises become very off-putting. So, you, you know, getting someone in the studio to be expressive and like you and I, we're Italians, we talk very much with our hands. We want you to move your hands, but we don't want to hear any sound from it. You know, it's, it's, it's really tricky. So it's tricky from, from the people who are in the booth And it's tricky on the outside because, you know, the, the level of concentration is um, – it's mind-numbing because we do sessions. We start 10 o'clock in the morning. We go to around 1, break for lunch. You know, there's a few breaks between 10 and 1 where take a bathroom break or just uh, just – stop for a few minutes and just let your head clear. And then after lunch, they come back and they record from, you know, say two o'clock to five o'clock. And then, you know, an average book, you do that three, four days in a row. But I've done audio books where we, we, it took 10 days like that to record. I can only imagine how hard it must be for the person in the booth too. Oh, absolutely. It's not easy to read that long and keep the quality of the performance. I might imagine that after two hours you may slow down or speed up a little bit, just slightly so that you barely notice it. But of course that shouldn't happen. So what are the most common problems in the sense that arise like speed change? Well, you know, um, when I first started, almost all the people that we used were celebrity talent. And they weren't necessarily gifted at uh, audiobook reading. As a matter of fact, the term audiobook didn't exist when I started. That term was coined a few years after I was in the business. But it was originally, it was almost all celebrity talent is either an author 
or um, we did a lot of stuff with with uh, Christopher Plummer. And in the fifties, they had uh, the Cadman had Boris Karloff read Rudyard Kipling, and I mean, just incredible stuff. We already dropped some names. Of course, the list of the people you've collaborated with just goes on and on and on and on, and, and there's no shortage of celebrities. Lucky, lucky me. I mean, because like I was saying before, you know, I mean, I I got into this at a late age, you know, and compared to most people and happened to hook up with Malcolm Addy. And so the, the musical stuff, those great, the great musicians, the greatest jazz musicians that ever lived, I, I've worked with. Uh, Teddy Wilson, uh, a recording I worked on with Malcolm Addy, uh, was recorded at the Town Hall in New York. And it was uh, Red Norvo on vibes, Louis Belson on drums, George de Vivier on bass, Benny Carter on alto sax, Remo Palmieri on guitar, Freddie Green on guitar, Pearl Bailey came out and sang a song, and of course, Teddy Wilson on the piano. And it might have been the last recording of Teddy Wilson ever made. He died shortly after that recording, and he was very sick at the time of the recording. And so when they were performing, he only soloed, but he pretended like he was comping, but he was in so much pain that he just he just couldn't do it. And we were set up, the, the control room was literally downstairs from, from the stage, so we couldn't really see what was going on, and we couldn't hear the piano during session with the parts where of the songs where he was supposed to be comping. And I had to go on stage and crawl under the piano to make sure that the microphones were working. So here I am, you know, crawling, they're, they're performing, you know, they're all in tuxedos, performing at the town hall um, with this stellar band, and I'm crawling underneath the piano in the middle of a tune just to make sure the microphones were working. It's pretty funny. Speaking of big names, do you think that when audiobooks were being made popular, you said that they weren't even called audiobooks up to some point, the involvement of celebrities actually helped people get closer, get familiar, want to buy audiobooks. Whereas today, because it's more common, we actually look for titles we may like. It's more about the books. We don't necessarily need a celebrity in the production to attract us to a product. It's more about the book. Yes. Um, in, the, in the early days that I was in it, it the celebrity helped sell the book. Now it's, it's, people are more savvy, so it, they're more driven by who the author is. Although a lot of people, you know, become devoted fans of specific readers. And over the years, there are now hundreds of professional audiobook readers that essentially all they do is read audiobooks. And they're really good at it. Whereas the, when we, we did celebrity talent, I mean, more often than not, you know, we were selective about who we picked, but uh, not everybody was a spectacular reader. Uh, whereas now, more often than not, you know, we have really good readers. We do have occasional author reads, or actually probably more than occasional, and a lot of them don't realize how difficult, physically difficult it is to do the the reading of an audiobook because it, it, it's a... It's a, a record that is preserved forever. And it's different than, say, public speaking, where even though a public speaker might be recorded for, you know, for archival purposes, when they make mistakes or stumble or don't say something completely clearly, you know, because their diction isn't terrific, it's all right. But when it's an audio book and it's an audio-only presentation – Those things really make a difference. So if you have someone who, who can't crisply pronounce words and do it in a rhythm that is um, pleasing, you know, because sometimes, you know, you, you, the quality of somebody's voice is just off-putting to the listener or their cadence. Um, some people just don't have, you know, the, the music in them. And a lot of times authors think that because they wrote it, they can best express it. But a lot of times that's not their talent. And I often use the um, analogy of, well, you know, you don't see screenwriters starring in their movies. They might be great screenwriters, but that doesn't necessarily make them great actors. 
and they might even know the difference between good acting and bad acting, but their talent is writing. Now, there are people who are multi-talented that have, you know, can work equally well in different disciplines, but really more often than not, one person's main talent is where they focus. When you're in the studio, especially for the long sessions, you have to pay attention to the clock that's ticking or the scratching and all these noises and make sure that the sound quality is always top. So do you have enough neurons available, I would say, to follow the story? So do you enjoy, actually, what's being read? Yes. Usually there's three people. There's the reader, there's the director, and then there's the engineer. And as an engineer, you're listening more for the technical things, though, you know, you do pay attention to, like, if it's a book about a fiction book where there's characters, you know, you, you want to make sure that they're using the correct voice. So you listen for that sort of stuff, but, you, li you know, you listen more for the technical stuff. And a lot of times, you don't, as, as an engineer, you don't hear a lot of the story because you're really listening more on the technical side. And the director is really listening more for the performance side of things and continuity uh, in terms of characters and that sort of thing. And the engineer focuses on, on the, the technical side. But you kind of mix both. And I've done situations where I've engineered and directed. And it's, it's difficult because both of them require a different kind of concentration. So doing both simultaneously can be difficult. But a lot of people do it because, it, because of the economics of things, not so much because they prefer to do it. But this business is not a business where you make a lot of money as a director or, um, or even necessarily as a talent. Pay scale has come down for professionals in the business considerably since I started. I mean, the people who do work a lot do well, but they work very hard for that money. Uh, you know, because as a reader, um, you know, you don't just show up and and start reading. I mean, it takes some uh, readers will read the book twice before they even show up at the studio, so that they are totally prepared, and then they read it again for for the actual recording. And they actually practice it out loud. Even reading it is not the same as saying it out loud. And sometimes wrapping your mouth around words is more difficult than you would think. And some books lift off the page easier than others. Some some don't make good audio books. Sometimes, you know, there, there are books that we put out and it's like, well, you know, we, we put it out, but it doesn't translate well to audio. Certain things where, where graphs are involved and, and that sort of thing, you can't, you can't make that happen in an audio book. So a lot of times that kind of information is lost. But uh, fiction is, uh, that's where, that's really where the magic happens. That's, that's sometimes you can just be totally spellbound by people's performances. I think that your job as audio engineer for audiobooks is really important because if you think about it, an audiobook takes many hours to be listened to and we often listen to audiobooks in our headphones and rarely there is music. So it's really just the voice in our ears. It's such an intimate thing. It's almost whispering in your ears. It's really intimate. So I hope that your colleagues in the music field don't look down to this craft because it's actually such a service you give to people that then have access to sometimes great works of literature. It's amazing. And, and uh, you know, for over 30 years, I have been an advocate of the highest quality recording for spoken word, and it's always been relegated to uh, when when we were first putting out analog uh, cassettes, we would use the lower quality tape and have the cassettes uh, high speed duplication uh, process, which it used to make me crazy because I would listen to the recording that I made, the master. And then I would listen to the what we sell as a product, you know, the cassette or even the LP, and I was always amazed at how poorly it sounded in comparison. Now, when I recorded analog, I recorded 15 IPS, Dolby A, and then when Dolby SR came out, we used Dolby SR at Cadman and Harper Audio. And 
I used to love the way it sounded. I mean, it just sounded so real and warm. And then I would get the test pressing or a test cassette, and I would just be amazed at, you know, the test cassette, you would hear the image kind of waver from left to right because the um, the high-speed duplication, and, and there would be so much tape hiss because they used garbage tape. And I used to say, you know, the human voice is the sound that humans know better than anything else in the world because you hear your mother's voice and even noises from outside your mother's body when you're a fetus. And our ear and our hearing is tuned to where the human voice is basically centered. So why relegate something that we know what it sounds like better than anything else to the lowest quality reproduction that we can do. And that just drove me crazy. And it still drives me crazy. I mean, we, we record 16-bit 44.1 here. And, 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 you know, their whole thing, well, you know, it gets mashed down to MP3. And my feeling is, is well, the better quality recording you have, the better it sounds when it's compressed down to an MP3. But they don't listen to me. I hope they do now. I hope they listen to this podcast. <laughs> is an audiobook ever read by more than one person? Yes, we do a number of multicast. And there's all kinds of headaches involved in that because even if you record them in the same studio, it's difficult, you know, it's a lot of work for, for the editor to put these pieces together from, you know, different recording sessions and make it sound like one um, cohesive thing. We've also, you know, done plays where it's multicast, but you're doing it all at the same time in the same place, and everybody's there. But what we do in, in the multicast audiobooks is, you know, some people will be in California, some in New York, some in, in Florida, Montana, whatever. And we've done stuff, I think we had recently did something that had 30 or 35 different voices on it. And um, it's, it's actually, it's a nightmare. It's logistically getting everybody to be in the studio at the right time in the right place. And because of the turnaround time, you know, we, we start recording something and it's released in, in some cases a couple of weeks after we finish recording. And there's a lot of work involved in, you know, from, from the recording process to the editing to having it proofed and then fixing, you know, what was revealed in QC, as we call it, and uh, getting the actors back to fix things, doing what we call pickup sessions. So when you add multiple people to that, it becomes really difficult. Um, so it, it, it's expensive and it's a lot of, lot of uh, work getting everybody where they need to be uh, at the right time. Do you ever add music? Or maybe sounds like traffic noise or someone slamming a door. Yes. Well, um, when I first started, every title um, we did at Cadman had original music composed for it. Wow. Uh, and it was some of it was just unbelievable. I did a, a an audio book with Glenn Close back in 1986 called Sarah Plain and Tall and. Now I can't remember the, the person who we hired to do the music, but he did just such an incredible job. I know I have his business card at home somewhere. But um, so we underscored. He, you know, he wrote a theme, and then you know, they would write other pieces of music that, that would reflect the theme, not unlike a movie where, where you have a recurring melody, but you use different instrumentation or less or more instrumentation or it's you know, at a brighter tempo or a slower tempo. Um, but it got to be too expensive to do that. So then we started using uh, music libraries, and they worked pretty well. And there were a bunch of, you know, like international music libraries uh, for this sort of thing. You know, they're used in commercials as well. And now, because production time is so short, most of them don't have music at all. And it's a real shame because uh, it really can be evocative. But once you start adding music and or sound effects, you've got to kind of be consistent throughout. You know, you can't just like put it at the beginning and kind of maybe toward the middle and then the end. Once you kind of dip your toe into that pool, you've got to continue it. Otherwise, it, it becomes um, – then it's a distraction to the listener. 
I did work on a, a title, the, the movie Home Alone 2, where we did an audio book of the Home Alone 2. We had Tim Curry narrate it, and then we had someone um, write music for it, uh, specifically for it. And we did sound effects and ambient background. And we still, at the time, we were still working in analog. So we did it on an eight-track Tascam, half-inch Tascam analog machine. And, you know, I wish I had a workstation at that time because it would have made it so much easier. Because, you know, we had to do so much, like, submixing, uh, particularly on the sound effects. We, we had a sound effects library, but not every sound effect was exactly what we were looking for. So what we'd had to do is uh, take that sound effect and augment it, either sometimes layer a couple of different kinds of sounds on top of it, or actually make sounds ourselves. You know, we drop toolboxes and stuff like that just to mimic the sound of uh, from the movie. And it was so much fun, and I would love to do more of that sort of stuff, but it's just too time-consuming and expensive. I noticed in the list of your nominations that there is a Grammy Award for spoken word recordings for children. So are audiobooks targeted for children a big chunk of the market? Yes. Whole, whole different, some companies have a whole different division. Like our children's audio books are done by the children's book department. Um, usually they, you know, it's, it's, um, it's freelanced out, but we don't do much of the children's stuff, although there's a tremendous amount of uh, children's audio published. Um, I have worked on quite a bit of it, but um, for the most part, it doesn't come through here. Uh, or we have five studios in New York, and we have 10 in Los Angeles. And um, most of the stuff we do is all adult, and, and the children's stuff is, is usually done out of house. But occasionally, I do a few of them, and I have worked on probably over the years, probably a hundred or so. We have talked about audiobooks now for a while, but we've mentioned already that you're also a musician yourself. Can you tell us a little bit more about you, not as audio engineer for audiobooks, but as a musician? Okay. Well, first of all, I don't call myself a musician. I call myself a guitar owner. <laughs> um, I, I think I play better than some people who are millionaires who call themselves musicians, but I don't consider myself a musician. Music has always been a passion of mine. Uh, my father was a singer in, in big bands in the uh, 1940s. Um, What was his name? Rocco V. Romaniello. He sang with... Carmen Lombardo's orchestra. Carmen Lombardo is Guy Lombardo's brother. But my father's mother, who was from Italy, was afraid that my father would turn into a, a heroin addict or something because that's what happened in the 1940s. You know, uh, there was a lot of drug use, believe it or not, um, back then. So, so he never pursued it farther than that. So by the time I came along, he was out of the, the music business. But he actually was quite a singer and had about a three and a quarter octave range for a male. That's pretty outstanding. And he sang in Italian. How much better can it get? I actually have two 78s that he recorded at NOLA Studios in New York in 1945, where he does like a medley of about 13 tunes with just him and a piano player. And of course, the records are in absolutely terrible condition. But even then, you could hear that he could sing. I mean, he really could sing. Was he singing around the house? Yes, but um, my father died 49 years ago last week. So I was 14 when my father died. And he had been sick from the time I was about seven. He had a heart attack at 44 years old. It was a rather devastating heart attack. As a matter of fact, back then you couldn't visit your um, parents in the hospital uh, if you were under a certain age. And he was in the hospital for a number of weeks, and I almost didn't recognize him when he came home. So, yes, he did. He, he sang a little bit around the house, but uh, unfortunately, you know, and, and it, he was a very frustrated because he, he didn't pursue it, because he was good. He was uh, 51 years old when he died, so... I'm sorry to hear that. I guess that he gave you his passion for music, though. That's where it comes from. Oh, yes. Yes. I didn't, st I didn't start singing and playing till I was about 15. But I always... I mean, I sang to myself, but um, 
I didn't start, you know, singing and playing in, in any kind of earnestness uh, until I was about 15. So again, a late start. But early in my um, engineering career, I got to work with um, Malcolm Addy, who I mentioned much, much earlier in, in the recording, who was the chief engineer at Abbey Road from 1958 to 1968. And with him, I've done about 150 live recordings. And we just did a recording in mid-June, just before I met you, uh, probably his last jazz recording. We, we recorded a, a Brazilian jazz band up in Tarrytown, New York. And he's going to be 85 on this Saturday. I'm going to his 85th birthday party. And I think he's pretty much going to hang up his recording shoes. But I met up with him in 1983 and have been his assistant since then. So uh, whenever he goes out to do a location recording, if I'm available, I'm his assistant. And um, that's where I got to work with so many of these great jazz musicians was on his recordings. I was the assistant on many of them. But, you know, I'm not a fanatic for jazz, but I had never experienced real live jazz until I worked with Malcolm. And I was just amazed that, you know, you could get 20 people together and they could look at this piece of paper with all these black dots on it and all come together and count it off and make music. The first album I, I worked on with Malcolm was at the studio that I was working at in Rutherford. And we recorded a 20-piece band um, for two days and mixed on the third day and we had an album. It was Jimmy McGriff Orchestra. And the album is called Skywalk, and it was on Fantasy Records. And we did two punch-ins. That's it. We, we fixed two, like, eighth-note sections that were maybe um, a half a measure long. That's it. Everything else was recorded live, everybody in the same room at the same time. We had uh, Kenny Washington on drums, uh, Jimmy McGriff on B3, and he played bass pedals on B3, so there was no bass player. Jimmy Ponder on guitar. Kenny Werner on piano, and the horn section was, I, I forget exactly who was in the horn section, but it was a real classic big band horn section. It was five saxes, four trombones, and four trumpets. And we had everybody in the room at the same time, two days, recording, and day three mixing, and pencils down, we're done. When I got out of audio school, I thought I was going to make a record uh, much like the way they were doing them in the late 70s and early 80s where, you know, they'd do the, the rhythm section separate, do all the overdubs and sweetening and all this other stuff, you know, over the course of weeks and maybe even months and do 70 billion different mixes of one tune. And I thought that's the way I would want to work. And after about two hours of that kind of work, I thought, I, this is not for me. I'm more of a, what I call a documenter than a fabricator. Can you elaborate a little bit on these two concepts? What's the difference between a documenter and a fabricator? First of all, like documenting is uh, more, uh, you know, I, I, I prefer live performance recording. And, and there's a lot of things that go wrong in those kinds of situations. But, but they're much, I find them to be more magical. The imperfections are inconsequential compared to the magic that happens in a performance. Because as a performer, my own self, when, when the audience is giving you positive feedback, it changes the way you play. And when your bandmates or the, the people you're performing with are also doing that, there's a magic. Now, it's not that it can't happen in the studio. It happens lots of times. But when you listen to, you know, think about like the great jazz recordings of the 50s, you know, Miles Davis and that sort of stuff, the Ellington and the, the Basie stuff. All that stuff was done live. And... That was the magic of it. You know, they had full orchestras in the studio and they cut live. And a lot of the times, you know, there, there was not an editable format. You know, you couldn't edit a 78. Um, it wasn't until tape came along that you could actually, you know, edit, say, the first half of the tune from take one into take three's version. So I think of myself as, you know, more of like a, a photographer, you know, where I'm taking a picture of, of, of something. Um, I try not to put my thumbprint on it. I just want to capture what's happening. 
I think the perspective of the documentary shows a great love for the acoustic event, for the live music that's happening. Well, you know, because I, I feel like I'm a witness as opposed to somebody who's making something. You know what? I, you know, I'm just putting the my my audio cameras in place and letting them do the work. You know, a lot of a lot of engineers, particularly in the rock and roll business, you know, think it's all about them. You know, and the truth is, is all the engineering finesse in the world is is almost, as far as I'm concerned, is meaningless if you have to auto-tune somebody's voice or instrument. I, that stuff just makes me crazy. I just, you know, uh, or, you know, everything is, is re, you know, configured to be on the beat and right on, you know, where it's locked in on a grid on your Pro Tools. You know, to me, that's just not, that's not music. Like you were saying, like electronic stuff. I mean, music is supposed to breathe. It slows down and it speeds up. Yeah, it's supposed to be at a specific tempo, but it's got to breathe. And if it doesn't, it's, you know, it's not going to be, I find it not to be as moving. Um, and, you know, maybe that's just my bias, but, you know, music doesn't have to be performed by like precision greatness. I mean, I appreciate precision greatness, you know, the Al Dimiolas and the John McLaughlins and that sort of stuff that can play a million notes. Um, but it still comes down to saying something musically. And, you know, just, just today I was listening to um, one of my favorite blues guys, Albert King, and the guy played very few notes in comparison. But, man, he made them say something, you know. I don't get that from a lot of, you know, like contemporary stuff. I mean, I get it. You know, it's a business. But it, to me, I don't listen to a lot of that. I, I don't listen to any of it, to be honest with you. Um, I listen to what I like. Speaking of what you like, there is something you said when I was in New York and we spent that couple of hours chatting when you were showing me around your studios. Something that really stayed with me. Most people say, I like music, but you said, I like noise. I, I do. I, you know what? One of my favorite sounds, and it's a terrible sound when you think about it, is like a needle being pulled across a record. It's just, um, I don't know what it is about it, but their sound just does something. Um, it it's, can evoke so many different things. My first tape recorder I got, I was 10 years old, and G.I. Joe dolls had just come out um, the year before. And they, you know, it was the first time boys had dolls. And I got this $10 tape recorder that was had three-inch reels and a crystal microphone, and it was an Acme brand tape recorder. And I did background tapes for my G.I. Joes. So I, I would do, uh, I put the, the microphone on my picnic table in my backyard and tapped with my fingers on the wood for machine gun fire and, you know, pretended to be bombs going off and that sort of thing. And that was my first introduction to audio. Creating your own soundtrack. In 1965. <laughs> Little did I realize that 16 years later, I would become a recording engineer. And, and actually, that's a pretty amazing story as well, if I may. Mm -hmm. um, uh, when I was... Uh, I met my wife in 1980, and in 1981, we happened to be somewhere and ran across someone that she knew, and that person worked for the um, county government, and he was uh, involved in a program called CEDA, which is the Compulsory Education and Training Act, and which was a program that Jimmy Carter introduced in uh, when he was president. And because of that program, I was I went to their I guess their their learning center is what it was. Uh, I forget exactly what they called it, but where I was evaluated over a six week period with about fifteen other people. And what they would do is is they would see where your strengths and weaknesses are, and they would help you find a career. You know, like electrical wiring, or or I made a toolbox out of sheet metal. Um, there were a number of different like workstations where they tried to see what your aptitude was, and. At the time, I was 26, so I had been a, a manual laborer for the last eight years and um, was going nowhere fast. And they said, well, you know, you scored high enough on, this, on your aptitude tests that we will give you enough funding for a year's worth of uh, trade school in any discipline that you would like. 
um, so long as it's an accredited school. And a friend of mine had gone to the Institute of Audio Research, and he recommended it, and I went there, and, and I liked it, and I always wanted to get into audio, but I didn't know how to, and that was my introduction to audio. And so the government paid for my tuition, they paid for my books and my calculator and my lab fees, and they paid me $1.50 an hour for classroom time and $10 a week for uh, car fare or subway fare. And as a result of that, I went from September 1981, graduated in September 1982, and since then, I've been making a living as an audio engineer. And had I not had the luck of running into this, this person and him hooking me up with CETA, I'd, like I said, I'd be making cardboard boxes somewhere or, or it'd be a landscaper or something. Not that there's anything wrong with landscaping and making cardboard boxes, but I actually find audio far more interesting. This doesn't sound just like a nice training program. It's a program that can turn lives around. It did. Of great social utility. I'm sure that if it still existed, it would be repealed by this administration. Well, Reagan repealed it which is exactly what happened. Reagan repealed it. I, I got in just under the wire, and it opened up a world to me that I would have never, ever seen, and it's a result of the CETA program that myself and probably thousands of other people, you know, were, you know, the saying, you know, you can give a man a fish or you can teach him to fish. Well, I got taught how to fish, and thankfully... I've been able to do that, and I hope to do it for another 10, 12 years before I have to retire. I wish you can do that, and I also wish that you keep playing music and being a musician. I anticipated a small surprise before. The surprise is that we would like to close this episode of Technoculture with a song that you wrote. Is that correct? That is correct. It's called It Helps Not to Know Me Well. And, and there's a story behind that title. There certainly is. <laughs> Many years ago, I think it was still in the 90s, I was working with an, an actress named Catherine Walker. And at the time, she was married to James Taylor. And she was telling me and my partner, Rick Harris, uh, about this new album that was coming out. It was a live album. And in between the songs, they left in some of the banter between James and the audience. And in the middle of one of these bantering sessions, Somebody screams out from the audience, James, I love you. And he says, uh, it helps us not to know each other well. And I said to Rick, I said, that's a song. Mm -hmm. And about 15 years later, I wrote a tune called It Helps Not to Know Me Well. And then to make things even more crazy, when I was at the conference in Culpeper with you, we were lining up to have our picture taken in the lobby, which is being Posted, I believe, in Mix Magazine and Pro Sound News and some other magazines. Um, and rightly so. Right. It was a memorable conference. Oh, it was tremendous. Uh, best AES event I've ever attended. But as we're lining up for the picture, George Massenberg sidles up next to me. And, and my name tag happened to be turned around, so you couldn't see my name. And he says to me, hi, Richie, how are you doing? And I said, George, I can't believe you remember my name. He said, well, you know, you have a presence on the Internet. And I said, really? I said, well, you know, it helps not to know me well. And he looks at me and he says, that's from my record. And he either produced, engineered, mixed the James Taylor Live album that, that I was talking about with Catherine Walker. But that was 25 years ago. And the fact that, that, A, that George Massenberg remembered me after talking to me one time maybe eight years ago, I was just dumbfounded. You know, I, 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 I didn't know what to say. I mean, George Massenberg is like just one of the greatest all-time recording guys ever. And um, I was just over the moon that he even remembered me. But uh, that recording, that chance recording that happened in the 90s and then gets kind of echoed back in 2018 is, is pretty amazing. So tell me about the recording. This is recorded by you and your band, correct? It's, it's a live recording of, of my band, uh, the original Famous Rays, and we're a New York-based band. And for New York people, in New York City, there are about 150 different Rays pizzas that all purport to be the original Famous Rays pizzeria. And our hope is that one of them will sue us for using their name, and then we will actually become famous. 
we were leaving rehearsal one night and uh, we, we didn't have a name for the band and I was in a band previously and we never had a name and it just kind of disintegrated and I was certain that it was because we didn't have a name and an identity. So we were leaving rehearsal one night and in about a two block span we passed two Ray's pizzas and I said, oh, we'll call ourselves the Famous Ray's and found out there was another band called the Famous Rays. And I said, well, you know, we'll do one better. We'll be the original Famous Rays. So this recording is the original Famous Rays performing at well-known music venue here in New York City called The Bitter End, and it was from December 30th, 2017. Thank you very much, Richard. Let's listen to the song. You might think that I'm nice. You might even think that I'm swill. When I leave this veil of tears, I'm going straight to hell. It's hard to know. Well, one can never tell. So I'm warning you now. Helps not to know me well. Well, I try to do right. You know, I try to play it fair. Every time I turn around, I'm getting in someone's hair. It's hard to know. Well, one can never tell. Like I told you before, helps not to know me well. Rafik says on on the tenor sack. And I only make them sad It's hard to know Well, one can never tell Take my warning to heart Helps not to know me well Well, you might think that I'm nice You might even think I'm swell When I leave this fellow tears I'm going straight to hell It's hard to know Well, one can never tell like I told you before, have not to know me well. Thank you for listening to Technoculture. Check out more episodes at technoculture-podcast.com or visit our Facebook page at Technoculture Podcast and our Twitter account, hashtag Technoculture Podcast. <laughs>